All right, well, here we are yet again, Mr. Alan Romero. Thank you for joining for my musings. Um, pleasure. The uh, to start off such a beautiful episode, I thought um, we could start by you selecting a whiskey, um, as you mentioned before, that you would like to drink, keep you warm. Let's hit the Finlagen. Finlagen. <laughs> Do you actually want some Finlagen? Sure. Okay. Are you able to get some Finlagen, Sean? Sure. It's nice and early for some Finlagen, but hey, it'll keep you warm. Um, very good. So we were talking before, and I thought, fuck it, let's just make sure we get something on because we've done it before. Like, let's do a podcast. An hour and a half later, having a coffee, and we're we should just like, really record that. Okay, let's go record. Yeah, right. Mainly because it's interesting, and, and so well, I find it interesting. You find it interesting. So, and we we're talking about how. Um, thank you, Sean. That's not what we're talking about, but talking more about how um, the difference between egg cone and, and Wilkes. Is it, is it John Wilkes? John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, I don't. I don't. John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> Who assassinated Lincoln? No, it was <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, Robert Wilkes. Robert Wilkes. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I don't know either guy, right? But it was more so the account of like, from all accounts, Ed Cone seems to be a pretty good guy. Um, I have, well regarded, let's say. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. And I mean, I, I have absolutely no connection with Wilkes, but mm, I, I hear more negative connotations towards it. But that wasn't the core of the conversation. The core of the conversation was then how do we make sure our kids aren't assholes? Yep. <laughs> Which is a, is a normal sort of transition for us but in it's our conversations. Um, and unfortunately, not a question that gets asked enough, I would say. <laughs> Probably, yeah. It's like, well, just don't do what I did and you shouldn't become an asshole. Mm. Uh, what did you do? I don't know. I was asleep for 20 years. I don't even know which 20 years either. <laughs> yeah. So, But it got on to the conversation. Um, I'm listening to a podcast at the moment with um, Jordan Peterson and uh, I think a guy called Warren Farrell. I'll double check the name. And Warren is, um, you, he is, I'll have a little bit, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, he is, uh, uh, the author of The Boy Crisis and Why Men Earn More. And so he, um, he was very, thank you. Uh, he was, um, it's a very interesting podcast. So effectively, they're talking about why fathering is important for, especially for young men, but for, for children anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're talking about the rough and tumble and how important rough and tumble is. And obviously, the mother could do it as well, but it, the, the masculine within the, the parenting role playing the rough and tumble um, is so crucial because it teaches a kid dexterity. Is that, is that word right? Dexterity. <laughs> yep. I just thought I'd put two R's in there. Yeah. Um, it's like the territory of dexterity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's, yeah, pull it apart. Yeah, it's a state. Anyway, <clears throat> so from that point it was also teaching the kid the difference, like, difference between aggression and, um, and assertiveness and um, also teaching them effectively how to have empathy because it's like no 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 you don't do that to your sister and um, it was very interesting because it sort of pulled us apart of like how important parenting is and both roles within the parenting relationship as well yeah so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably about 40 minutes through the podcast at the moment, but it's really fucking fascinating mm. um, to see the, the. I think, I can't remember who did the research, but mammals have a certain part of their brain which is actually specified for play because that part of the play actually helps develop their body awareness that, that you know, playing in the rough and tumble, so to speak, actually develops what's allowed, what's not allowed. Yeah. And I was talking to my girlfriend about this last night and she goes... Well, you stop living with your dad at eight, and then you know, did somebody else have some rough and play or whatever, a rough and tumble? And I was like, well, I played AFL, so I, there's with Aussie rules, especially as you get a bit older. There's there's a lot more contact in it, but here's the set of rules: you're not allowed to go above the head, you're not allowed to go too low, you can't throw your fists around. So here's you're allowed to have rough and tumble, but this is what you're not allowed to do. And I think that taught me a lot of spatial awareness. I know that the the rates of kids wrist um, breaking their wrists is like significantly higher than it was 15 to 20 years ago because they don't know how to roll they yep. don't know how to fall yep right and so when they fall they'll, they'll just do instinctively yep hands out and so this is where so much of that um play which we're trying to like really save kids from at this point in time is yep. like we're, we're actually doing a long-term disservice oh for sure wrapping them in bubble wrap doesn't help long term just castrates them physically mm. so to speak so there's any pr- play time is now almost completely structured like there's a significant lack of unstructured free play whether it's because you know the way they're going to hurt themselves or the kids aren't really like there's not a lot of go outside and play with your 
brother yeah because it's like oh what if they get abducted or something happens or they get hit by a car so it's like this fear that prevents parents from allowing their kids to go and do the things they need to do to become well-developed physically humans and then that obviously carries over to everything else as well like you don't want your kid to go and travel because what if something happens to them so you end up stunning their growth physically and mentally through your protection of them and that's something Peterson talks about a lot as well right Mm. yeah so I find it really interesting so I've I've talked to um you know uh young men in their 20s and uh like there's pretty consistent patterns that they'll do like when they were younger so this is stuff that like when we are able to have someone bring this into awareness we're like fuck we start to see patterns with things right and for uh, i can think of someone at the moment and one of their stories would be um they were the dad would teach them something and then the father would be like look just i'll just deal with it right i'll I'll finish it off because you're kind of you're learning but you're fucking around and the kid would then be like really quiet really internal and then go and play video games What's, what's the situation? So he's, what's he's, an example? Um, they're doing something on the car. Yep. Right? Or they're building... He's trying to do it. Yep, building a lot of box. Yep, exactly right. Dad's like, I'll do it. Yeah, so, you know, I'll do this. You got, no, you got to do it this way. No, no, I'm fucking told, just I'll finish it off. Yep. And so what ends up happening is that um, because maybe the, the father, and this is like, I don't know the dynamics. I'm just giving an, an ex- yep. example slash story. The father's like, fuck, you know, it's just easier if I do it. Yeah, for How, sure. However, the kid will then go play video games. Yep. Now, later on in life, when any situation similar to that arises, they find themselves playing video games. They don't know why, right? They're like, I just don't want to deal with shit, so I'll play video games. It's like, that's your way of winning. Mm. That's your way of, of showing your passive aggressiveness through aggressive video games mm. because you can't... I, I can't beat... I can't win. No matter what I do, I can't win in this example between you and I. Yeah. So I'm going to be silent and I'm just going to excuse myself and subconsciously I'm going to play video games because I can beat the fucking shit out of someone yep. and it's funny how like video games can actually be um, beneficial for the development of our understanding of how hierarchies of competence work because it shows you that you have to go through all of the levels to, to be able to win you yep. can't just go straight to the top mm. the issue is when do we get either young men or young women to start integrating that into the workforce and into schooling and all that sort of stuff if all they do if they stay there for too long if they stay in their mother's basement for fucking too long mm. then the the whole the cross education components of it is just gone yeah yeah it's interesting it's um I think that's what's su- <laughs> it's such a damaging thing about using like cheats when you play video games so let's say you start playing a game like this is too hard use the cheats to get all the guns and open all the levels up it's fun for about 10 seconds after that as soon as you have everything all of a sudden the, the fun of the game very quickly disappears yeah. so associating <clears throat> the reward system of putting the hard work in and then earning unlocking achievements all that kind of thing like that's something that's in a lot of games now like it's massive like achievement unlocked is like a massive thing because it's like it makes you feel like the effort you're putting in is working towards something which it kind of isn't it kind of isn't like it's nothing tangible in real life that's going to help you but it's something where you constantly being rewarded for work in games so I think it does definitely builds that system that you're talking about which is where you learn that the effort that you put in is rewarded by achievements unlocked in, in the long term which is probably a good metaphor for life really well it, it is it, there's, there's a direct application across as long as the person does the work yep. where the issue is is when the person doesn't do the work so um, that's the whole cheat code sort of thing right because subconsciously people are like surely there's an easier way to do this it's yeah man nature. yeah I think I can't remember what it was I think it might have even been in Central, Central Intelligence the movie with um, Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart oh, yeah. and um, I think Dwayne Johnson has this like The Rock just to clarify yep yeah and <laughs> just not, not to you anyway <laughs> Dwayne Richard Johnson <laughs> I don't even know what his fucking name is but so that jacked guy yeah that's right so for him it was uh, he was overweight in school and then when Kevin Hart saw him again later on he's like dude you look amazing he's like what did you do he's like oh it was really easy I just exercised two hours a day for 30 years <laughs> and that's all I had to do <laughs> and it's just like it's really simple right it's like well, what's the cheat code and that's what the fucking everyone's looking for what's the cheat code right and you know puff of resistance yeah that's just human nature but trying the, to save calories here he's trying to save food calories. is scarce yeah that's why I want to do a video of like um, a thousand calories for time on the air dine and just eat like two pieces on top of each other <laughs> sitting on the air dine 
How fast can you add a thousand calories? <laughs> yeah, they didn't say which way the calories were going. True. Think outside the box. No, no. pizza box. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's. I mean, that's something that I, I noticed. Like, I don't really play games anymore, but it was like that was something that when I used to play games on sixty four and stuff, it was like the first thing you do, especially if you like hired a game or if you had you had limited time. I felt you had limited time. It was like I want to get the maximum out of this in the shortest period of time. And that's what people are looking to do with their lives, I guess, is trying to maximise. But there's a lot of things that you miss when you cut the workout. And that's why, I, I guess, from like a fitness perspective, you know, I used to get young guys coming to me <clears throat> back in the elite days and like, oh, I want to get like as big as I can. It's like, do you think I should take steroids? And I was like, well, my gut says no, but I, I couldn't really articulate why I thought that was a bad idea. So th- I guess the first thing was I thought it was just being lazy, right? I'm like, well... This is a bad start. If you haven't even started and you're already looking for a shortcut, it's like it doesn't bode well for your success in the industry, which generally is a marathon, not a sprint, but also in life. Like all the things that you have to learn from doing it properly or doing it naturally, I should say, they have way bigger repercussions for outside the gym than they do inside the gym. Like the stuff that you gain mentally and emotionally is much more powerful and long lasting than the stuff you gain physically. Yeah. Like you having to learn the importance of like patience, commitment, dedication, hard work, all those things, which I would argue would will last forever, whereas the physical will only last as long as you physically train yourself, right? Yeah, it's also... I completely agree with you, right, on that, that note. It's, it's really looking at it like... People want to... They, they don't understand... And I say this because I've been caught up in this many a times. They don't understand it's not about the end result it's about the process it's, it's, it's sort of it's cliche like who you become along the way but it's actually true because if this is why so many people that win uh, the lotto end up losing it because they, they, they didn't do the work to earn it so they don't know how to keep it and handle it right easy come easy go yeah and so that's the same thing with results in the gym it's the same thing like for us the early days of my business things were going really well man Things were going really well. They're going, they're going well now, but I've had some fucking winters, right? And they were exactly what I asked for. It wasn't like, oh, the market and oh, this. It was like, nah, I got fucking cocky. I got cocky and I thought I can pull away, but not realizing people were joining my team because I wanted strong leadership, yep. right? And then I'm like, hey, everything's doing pretty good. I can pull away now. It's like, why? What for? Right? Like, what's better out there for you? I'm sure, I probably needed some rest or at least I justified it that way. Yeah. But the thing about it was... Uh, and this is where, you know, people say the industry is booming or there's a lot of people in the industry at the moment. You know, we've got like 16 to 18 gyms here in Mitchell. Like, I think Fish Week, where your gym's going, starting to get it like crazy like yeah, that as well. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, I, most of the people that I know starting gyms, I don't know all of them. They're good people, right? They're, most of them have good intentions. But the thing about it, it's like, who wants to be here will be here in five to 10 years, 20 years and further, Right. And some people won't, and a lot of people won't, because uh, I know people that start a CrossFit gym because they go, oh, I think this will be a good um, income source. You're like... <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, a, you, a, you're missing the point. B, no. <laughs> like, it's just... It's a bad idea. Well... It can't. The the fitness industry is as bad as the beauty industry. It's just it's the prime, same thing, really. It's fucking prying on insecurities, right? Yeah. You know, and we makeup industry, we say that. Right? Yeah. It's just prying on insecurities, and there are people that no one knows about making fucking millions of dollars, right? And so that's where you see someone like Mark Bell, who created a couple of, you know, slingshots and, and the rest of that, and he's a millionaire. And I'm like, cool, good. He's contributing to the fucking cause, or he's trying to make the industry better. I've got no problems with that guy being a millionaire. Yep. Not at all the fucking overweight business person that owns one of the Globo gyms that no one knows about. It's like, mm, you know, that doesn't feel as good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to to judge, I would say, if you don't know someone's story. But I would agree. Like, some people appear to be quite clearly doing it for... They're rewarded appropriately for the value they provide to the industry. And there's certain people who are ripping people off with disingenuous marketing and products that prey, prey on people's insecurities that don't actually work and don't deliver a result and keep people stuck in a loop and perpetuate the obesity epidemic and all the bullshit that goes along with it. Mm. But it's just too unregulated, so what do you do? 
Well, you would hope people you educate, right? That's what we do. I mean, th- those people also have given. You know, I, I'm. I, I, I bring them forward to be like, look, there are these people here and it doesn't feel good, but they've also given a lot of PTs work. Yep. Right? Fucking shit tons of PTs. It's all not all bad, right? Absolutely not. It's given, you know, the most of the Globo facilities and commercial facilities, they only want 20% of their clientele to rock up. Yep. Right? I, and, and I think, you know, Drew from Alchemy said that he worked with one of the guys from there and they said, oh, we can't email because we'll wake the sleepers. <laughs> right which is like what do you mean it's like well if we bulk email everyone we'll get bulk emails back saying oh I forgot to cancel my membership can you cancel my membership yep and so they just don't email out and so if they you know you get a gym that has 3,000 members and let's split f- 1,500 evening 1,500 morning right if everyone was going it's like well that's going to mean a couple of hundred people at 5.36 in the morning how many treadmills do they have how many barbells do they have they, they don't set up for that many that people. Business model doesn't support it. Not at all. So they actually don't want people to rock up. So there's those elements of it. But the thing about it is that for a lot of people, it gives them work, yep. right? And it gives people an opportunity to go, oh, I just want to try this fitness thing and I'm going to pay 15 bucks a week. I'm not against that at all. Like it, it, it works. It undeniably has positives to it, even though the concept is negative. You're setting up a business to try to take people's money for them not showing up. Yeah. Yeah. But a certain percentage of them that's their first experience in the gym and they might fall in love with fitness as a, as a result of it sure. you might have PTs who launch their career actually helping people as a result of that as well yeah. so it's like you know there's golden maggots inside the rotting carcass that's a very <laughs> and they're going to turn into these stunning golden flies and <laughs> just rub their hands together on someone's arm yeah okay Mm. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I get the analogy and I think it's true because it's sort of like, I don't hate on the commercial facilities. I, I point it out, but it's also like for us, it's like, well, for us smaller community facilities, yeah, we're going to be more than a commercial facility. Like, we have to be because otherwise we can't pay the fucking lease. Yeah. Right? You want, you know, people, people, people want, they know price, but they don't know value. And when people start to see value, it changes everything, right? And they start to see, right, there's more to this than exercising yeah i'm not paying you to motivate me now right i understand it and they see value in that and so the flip side to that is if no one has ever been to a let's say a commercial gym where they don't get value they don't get that community Mm. feel then they're never going to appreciate what you offer yeah if you're the first gym someone's ever been to it's bittersweet it's good because you're their first fitness experience and you can set them off on the right track right off the bat and the converse that is they don't actually appreciate what you have to offer because they've never seen what shit looks like Mm. so like when you, we get people to come through like to learn to lift and stuff and it's, it's awesome when they're like they're too scared to go to a gym so they come to like a private studio or a private yeah. facility but it's like you guys don't know how good you have it here <laughs> like yeah, I yeah, should yeah. send them away to go train at like a snap or something like that and then yeah. come back and see what it's like when someone actually gives a fuck about your progress and your results yeah and obviously that's not to say that people at snap don't care it's more like that's the larger minority well the business model doesn't support it like you yeah. said like yeah. the ideal client is someone who pays and doesn't come mm-hmm. yeah so indeed and you, you got to play the game I mean there's, there's we're, we're in this enterprise time at this, this point, in, point in time with everything where people go fuck it I'm going to open up a coffee shop I'm going to do craft brewery I'm going to have my own little distillery I'm going to open up my own gyms but like there's too many gyms it's like if you had so we've got Club Lime here in Mitchell if we had two Club Limes that'd be too many too, too many facilities but we can support 15 smaller facilities because it's actually less people if each one has 100. Yep. Right? It's like too too many gyms for what? Like, it doesn't make any sense. We're it's not... Let's just, just think. The market will correct. If there's too many gyms, there won't be too many gyms. Yeah. Like, That's... no one's got a gym here that they've got just a 500 grand in the bank they're just going to pump into a business running a loss. Like... Yeah. So... But yeah. that's... Canberra is like heavily saturated with gyms, but... Totally. It'll always regulate. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and people people talking about like competition. It's like, yes, competition is important to be wary of your competition. I think at some point you got to find some some balance of being able to play the game, but you can't lose yourself in that process. You have to know your identity as a facility. Otherwise, if you're keeping you know an eye on what the CrossFit gym down the road is doing, and then you try and offer what they offer, it's like, dude, you're playing their game now. You know, uh, you can't be reactive. You, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. You can never, yeah, you can never win like that, and it's just stressful. Like you're constantly like trying to see what they're doing and match it or beat it. Or it's like we obviously don't have a genuine, authentic product if you can 
modify it based on someone else's actions. So how are you going to attract people you actually want to work with if yeah. your product is just based on external influences? Yeah. It's not strong. No. If you want to build a community off of that, it's a very weak foundation. Mm. It just sounds like a lot of energy as well. Well, it, it does, but it's also, it's a lot of worry. Yeah. Right? Because it's like, and it doesn't mean that, the, that you know, as a business person, you're not going to get worries anyone gets worries but it's more like the the concern of of what you say let's say hypothetically i'm concerned about how you're running yours and how i should react to that it's like well i'm i'm worried about something that's out of my control Mm. right and i remember a place where i used to work and then he had a guy leave there and start up something similar um and he reacted like he reacted like a fucking ass hat like he would park his car like right out the front of the door you could barely get into the door right the old boss to this and it's just like if you don't treat people good they're going to leave and if you treat people good they're still probably going to leave and, and that's okay because people have their own story to write it's like y- you you have an opportunity in this person's life to play a positive role do that and um, and the interesting thing was that when when this second guy opened up the gym he, he would just he would complain about it and you know people he, they're stealing clients and it's like dude you don't do any work to keep these people here he, they're not, he's not stealing clients he's offering something different and better than what you're doing to these individual in, individuals you can't steal a client yeah I, like, I, I want to do a little video where I walk, say I walk into your gym and I just go and literally pick someone up <laughs> and just run outside just, that's stealing clients <laughs> yeah that's stealing clients but it's also like it's kidnapping yeah but they're still <laughs> paying you I have to get their debit details and all that it just you don't steal clients and it's just such a, it's such a passive way of just blaming your you know something else outside of you it's just like and I remember we were the, we were the fifth gym here in Mitchell um, five years ago five and a bit years and I remember saying and it was early days I'm like look if a CrossFit gym because we're seen similar to that from, from an outsider's perspective it's like if they open up across the road you know cool that, that's fine which they had ended up doing like literally eight months later yeah. and um and there was always the idea of like, if I have clients leave to go there, either A, it's time for them to move on, or B, I'm not doing something. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with them. Oh, they offer something cheaper. Okay. What, what, you want me to order? If I offer something cheaper, I won't have a fucking gym. It's like, what is it you want? You offer it cheaper for three months, and then everyone's done. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. It can't be reactive, right? I think, especially like if you want to have an effect on the industry, which. I think we both do. It's like you have to be a pioneer to a certain extent because it's the industry's gone backwards. Mm. Like it's just it's become completely. It's just a separation. There's people who are purely in it to make money, and it's kind of there's no real overlap with how much you're helping people. It's more selling thirteen dollar ebooks and how to get shredded in two days on skinny tea. And then there's people who are really bad at marketing, probably really good at training and no one knows who they are and they're helping their gym and that's about it mm. so it's like there's, a, and I have been in this in this dichotomy myself where you don't want to be like the people who are screaming loudly because mm. they're screaming bullshit information and so you associate marketing with bullshit which is not necessarily true but it's so rare that you see someone spending a lot of money on marketing who actually is genuinely trying to offer a product that helps people as yeah. opposed to just trying to rack up cash so so my solution to that was like, well, I'm just not going to market because I don't want to be like that guy. Yeah. And it's like, well, who are you helping when you're doing that? I mean, I had like heaps of complexes like that, like moving into obviously things like starting this podcast and, and doing a, a YouTube channel and, and marketing events and all that sort of stuff. It's like, I, I didn't want to look like, so there's, there are, let's call them trainers or coaches in the industry that, um, need to develop how to market right they just need to build that skill and it's important because it's communicating i'd say most yeah that i know yep absolutely but there's also so there's trainers that um that don't market and there's marketers that don't train people yep right but they're a coach it's like no you're a marketer right and that that's that's fine it's just that you have a certificate for but you're a marketer you market and and that's what you really enjoy doing. Yep. It's not necessarily the person's outcome that you want best over your income. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be like that. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that's what a lot of people are. And so when I was like, fuck, how do I communicate? And I had to really break it down. I'm like, okay, if somebody came to my seminar, would they benefit? 
and then I had to pull apart the thoughts that were like, no, oh, they already know all this stuff and all that. It's like, no, 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 they would. Right, then fucking tell them about it. Right? Let them decide if they're going to come. Yeah. But at least give them the opportunity to, to go, you know, you've for, for similar to yourself, it's like you've been in this industry for fucking years. Yes, you have value to give plenty of people. Stop being a bitch. Get out of your own way. And there was a certain conversation like that. And then, you know, I had to work with my coach through understanding blockages, if you want to call it that to get over mm. in order to be able to get out of my own way to get over myself to be able to like look run these seminars and I think if you know and you came to my one on the weekend yeah and so it's just like you know does everyone already know this no and no one fucking knows this yeah like no one yeah especially yeah. not in the industry no like maybe people who study you know philosophy and psychology as their main thing but not people who train people yeah it's all primarily in the physical. And the only reason why they ever venture into the psychological is they start to see the physical leaving holes. Mm-hmm. And that's when you have to start. So you have your protocol. This is how you help someone lose weight or whatever. And you're like, ooh, this worked for me and these five guys, but didn't work for these six guys. Cool. And what stopped them? All right, now you have to keep going down, down the rabbit hole. You eventually, eventually end up with some, more often than not, there's some emotional or psychological blockage, which is forcing them to will lead him down the path of making it difficult for them to drop weight or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was more like from a rehab standpoint where it's like, well, now you get into the point where you're exhausting your physical corrective options. And it's like, well, how much now do we need to look into the mental, emotional component of what might be, you know, the rehabilitation process. So it's like, for most people, we only learn things when we're kind of, when we need to, I would say. Like those are the, the things that, like I, I've tried not to, if I'm reading a book and it's, not grabbing me I don't force it because I just know the information is not going to go in so I try to sort of let I guess you might say like intuition guide you when you're reading something you can't put it down there's a reason for that you need to finish it so from that perspective from us from a psychological standpoint for most people they only ever get there after they've exhausted all the other options so once you need to get there once you feel like the other stuff you're doing isn't working you've still got holes that's when people start to look into that but for most people in this industry because it is something that people don't get in to, get into to fix their mental problems they get into to fix their physical problems right mm. they want to lose weight they want to gain muscle they want to be stronger they want to rehab it's not like something's wrong with my brain i want to use the physical as a medium to get there for the most part yeah 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 it's interesting like the obesity epidemic and it's like we're not in an obesity epidemic right we're in a misinformation mass marketing epidemic Yep. And one of the one of the, the symptoms. Yeah, exactly right. And so we're we're trying to treat the symptom. And it's mm. like no 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 no. Like it's that's that's not really what's going on. But people but there are people that make a lot of money of you thinking that. Yep. And so let's let's you know, let's stay there, but we're not. We're in a misinformation mass marketing epidemic. And so the easiest way is to have a confused crowd. Yep. If we have a confused crowd and then teach them sell them the solution, then they'll buy it. Yep. And that's where it's like we have the most doctors, the most nutritionists, the most pharmaceuticals, the highest access to food, the highest access to information, the most gyms, yet we're the most unhealthiest we've ever been. We have the most, the, like, the rates of suicide are through the roof. And, you know, in comparison, it's just like more gyms isn't going to, a, a new booty program, Better program isn't yeah. going gonna, to. The latest diet. Yeah. It's, and I had this conversation um, the other day. Mm, People need to be more kind to themselves. I'm like, no, they don't. People need to stop being unkind to themselves. Right? Because it's like positive self-talk. It's like, oh, you know, more positive self-talk. It's like that's presupposing that you negatively self-talk. So rather than trying to build a positive... Like rather than trying to rehab all the time, why don't we just prehab so we don't need to rehab? Yep. And that's the same thing. It's like, well, I can't stop the negative self-talk. It's like, it, I know, I can tell. There's There's certain ways to work around that though because it's not like... It's, it's the understanding that if we own the thoughts and we that we identify, like, that's my thought. It's like, fuck, that was not your thought. That's the thought from fucking the bully in year six that told you that. That was his thought because of his fucking securities. And now you have it float around your head and you claim it as yours. Of course you're going to think that. Mm. And it's like, that's not always the case. It's just like, the whole thing about being kind, it's like, let's learn to be unkind. Like, let's, let, let's learn how to not be unkind to ourselves and people are like how, how do you do that it's, how is that even possible it's like well either continue to try and fix this rehabbing process which you're always reactive mm. or learn to be more proactive about this stuff and, and which one's more challenging I know which one yields a long term result I know which one yields a short term result yeah 
Yeah. And at some point, uh, like like drugs or caffeine, you will have to have more and have more and have more of it to get the same sort of response. Yeah. And it gets a point where you're like, oh, positive self-talk worked on the platform. Great. And then you go to the platform three competitions later, you're like, why is it not working? It's like, because you're fucking trying to rehab shit. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, always what you should be shooting for is striving for balance, right? Physically, I mean. So if I'm... I used to get, like, release work done every week, like, for eight months when I was having issues with my back and stuff. Now I don't get that stuff done. So it's not that I'm perfectly in balance, but I, I feel like you have a threshold that you can be under where you can be pain-free and functioning well. Once you start to break through that threshold, that's when you start to get signals from the body that tells you that something's not quite right. So I'd imagine obviously you know i'm not an expert in the the psychological but i imagine it would be useful if there was a system for identifying when you start to go above that threshold when you start to experience whatever unkind you know negative self-talk learning how to like i said not just trying to wait till the injury comes up and then play whack-a-mole and hitting these things on the head but actually trying to like use a system that you can assess where balance is so that you can guide yourself within that instead of having to wait for something to go drastically wrong before you do a repair job on it mm. so but like I said this is something that I'm very much a, a newbie in the realm of mm. um, but the importance seems quite clear yeah absolutely it is it's like um, it's even the the idea of conditional happiness is like you know when I get this I'll be happy it's like even just saying that sounds silly yeah absolutely it's like oh I, you know weight loss is the example and that's why I, I use weight loss a lot as the example and, and some people will be like oh you don't know what it's like it's like yeah I do I mean I, not, I don't know your story but I've had the same feelings and emotions you've had right I've just had, called them different things they've come from different areas like it just may not be the exact same but the thing about it it's like no one wants to lose weight right they, they want what they think they'll get yeah they want to play with their kids they want to be able to not second guess themselves and do all these sorts of things. Now, this is then some people go to this radically uh, acceptance of body, right? And and they'll say things such as like, oh, well, I'm beautiful and I, I love my body and I accept myself as I am, right? Male or female, I don't care. And it's like, yes and no. Because if you love your body, you would listen more to what your, your gut in relation to like gut health is telling you than what your fucking taste buds are telling you. Right? If you love your body, you don't poison it continuously with sugary foods. That, that's, that's just accepting what you are at this point in time and calling that love. And I think, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. It's like, let's just be honest and clear. And this is like, imagine for a second what, let's just go with Australia first. What Australia would be like if everyone decided to start eating food and that's it. Right? Like food. <laughs> Actual not, food. Yeah, like grew from the ground or had a mum. Yeah. Right? Not not carbonated, refined, artificial or processed. Just just for a month. Could you imagine what sales would plummet? I mean, we wouldn't be able to keep up with the fruits and vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably similar to like the whole gym side of things. But the, 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 that's in like 20%, 80% sort of thing. Yeah. But it's like the... It would be phenomenal. It for would, health? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And the, the companies that would just not be able to pay bills. Like it would just be... We vote with our dollar. And so, but it's, you look at the demands on families nowadays, it's fucking tough. What do you mean? Both parents working, you yep. know, retirement age being pushed back. Like, I look at that, I'm like, yeah, I get it, man. Like, fuck, get, get your microwave meals. Like, I totally understand. It's harder not to do that until you sit down one day and you realize that you can't move very well so have fun playing with your grandchildren yeah that's tough it's like it's like smoking like people will still smoke even though they know that that is going to kill you like it's become very clear but it's not going to kill you today or tomorrow or the next day or the next day or the next day so it's very difficult when that's delayed it doesn't have an immediate effect so it's the same thing with food it's like Big Mac's not going to kill you 10's probably not going to kill you 100's probably not going to kill you it's going to slowly reduce your quality of life to where you forgot what it was like to feel good. Mm. But it happens over such a gradual time period that you don't even notice it. Yeah, it's like creep loading. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's very difficult for people to, 
if you have an allergic reaction to food, that's an immediate response. People don't eat foods that they're allergic to for that reason. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. But you could say, in a way, we're all allergic to shit food. It's just a much smaller reaction Yeah. over a longer period of time. It's also like, the if something doesn't feel right in our guts, that comes after the taste buds are, yeah. you know, like, well after that point. And so it's sort of like, it almost goes back to the cheat codes, right? It's like, how do I figure this out now? How do I get the dopamine hit now? Mm-hmm. And um, instant you, gratification. Yeah, and you talked before. It's at the microwave society. It's like learn how to cook a roast, right? Rather than fucking put something in the microwave. But it's you talked before about having a system to be able to see when our thoughts are doing these sorts of things. It's like we have a system. It's just called awareness. Hmm. It's like when we have when we move into the space of being the observer of our thoughts and our actions and behaviors then we actually start to be able to have the power to choose. And that's the beauty of it, right? And it doesn't mean that, you you know, we talked about this on the weekend at the seminar. It's like, well, if I'm angry and I, I feel like sometimes if I block my re- reaction to that, then I'm not being genuine. Yeah. It's like, yes and no, like, because the the anger is the, is the, is the authentic feeling and how you choose to use that energy is... Is, is all in our power and so when we decide not to integrate compassion then it turns into aggression and now you know as passive aggressive is still passive aggression rather is still aggression mm. it's still dehumanizing you right I'm all first person I'm in pain so yeah take that and no one ever hurt someone from a place of happiness it's like yeah. happened to you Sean <laughs> old mate last night that had a couple of swings this year he just wasn't happy you should have yeah, gave him a hug you kind of yeah, did. That wouldn't have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and that cut nice. all. <laughs> yeah. So I guess coming back to awareness, and that's something that we're massive on in the gym as well. I guess it just takes time. I feel like if people maybe prioritize awareness from a younger age, then it's the same as like unstructured free play. If you let kids play, the chances of them getting to age 16 and running like a spastic and having to come to me and have all that stuff recorrected is very low. But the fact is, they don't really get a chance to figure it out themselves. So like you said, play is like a really, well, like Julian said, it's the only way that we learn. So one of the most important ways that we can actually experience a lot of, let's call it like low stress repetition. So if you're, if your play is the same as, as training, except for the guidance and the structure, right? So it's like, if you're being forced to do something repeatedly, it's way less fun and less, and less productive than repeating it because you'd like to repeat it, right? Mm-hmm. You play the same level on the video game 10,000 times and hate it way less than doing you know your homework because one you have to do and one you want to do yeah so i think from an awareness standpoint if there was more encouragement for people to assess themselves in the way that they feel instead of being distracted and oblivious which i think is probably the overarching main issue is that physical or psychological we're constantly being distracted by your phone or by marketing or by advertising we also want to be distracted because sometimes being like like in, in the short term it's the dopamine thing again like if I don't want to deal with my insecurities mm. as a general rule that's fucking tough right yeah and this is I said this to Jessie in my musings with her the other day it's like was it, like I sit, sat in a cafe one time and I'm like busy cafe there's you know um, businessmen there's 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 mums there there's business women there there's fireys there and I'm like there is probably at least one topic that if you brought up right now with any individual in here, they would start welling up. It's like, and when we understand every single person's like that, right, and we avoid a lot of it, most of us will avoid it most of our life. Yeah. And then just project it without realizing it, right? Hmm. And so it's like, a lot of us don't, we want to be distracted. We don't know that we want, we don't really want to be. Deep down, we don't want to be. Yeah. But the idea of, you know, it's almost like the Hulk, you won't like me if I get angry kind of thing. And it's like, sounds like you won't like you if you get angry. Yeah, it's just pain avoidance. Absolutely. And, and I get it, once again. It's not like it's not like I sit over here and sit in my little fucking Buddha Zen and go and fight every fucking dragon that I have. I'm like, all right, let's, let's, let's learn to stab a gecko today. I'm like fucking... Well, it's... Ah, bit me! <laughs> you know? it. Yeah, but it's it's just... it's, And that's why I say to people, like, it's, it's actually really... It's, it's really courageous to move towards things that are difficult. Yeah. And and if you continually do that inch by inch every single day, like you have no idea. Like we, we like you have no idea where you could be in ten years. 
So do you think that kids have an easier time addressing insecurities than adults do? Um, do they have the same emotional defenses that we do? Uh, I think they're taught, right? During, behavior, a, right? A, lot of, a lot of stuff is taught during childhood. But um, also a, a lot of kids, when they're young, they don't know what the emotions are. Like how, how does a kid know what shame feels like? Yeah. Right. Like, oh, that's shame. It's like, fuck. How does this four-year-old know what this is? They, they don't. So they just know happy, sad. Yeah. And you know, it, it. Peterson talks about this as well. Like, um, you can hear with a child crying whether it's angry, or whether it's actually in pain. And it's just if it's angry, it's actually like almost this deep screaming kind of crying. It's like it's an ang- it's angry about something, but it doesn't know how to do it. Like it's it's still learning what those emotions are and. Mm. So I, I don't know. I think it's a really challenging. I don't have the answer to it, but it's like with with adults, we have the the power of actually owning it. As a child, you don't know to own it. Like if if there's a child that's like, no, no, this is my fault, and I'm going to deal with this. You're like, oh shit, dude. Like that's great ownership. But there's always two gods, right? As a child, at least there's always two gods: mum and dad. And they decide if I'm in trouble or what's good and what's bad. Yeah. Right? And so um, if, if we don't disconnect from those gods and become our own adult and see them as adults who have their own insecurities and everything, then we will always be the, the god in that, you know, see them as gods in that realm and, and be a mere mortal and give my power over to them because they know better. Yeah. And so as adults, I think we definitely have the responsibility to take ownership of our shit yeah so you probably see where I'm going with this as an investigator so (laughs) it's one thing to be able to have someone come into the gym and because they're an adult they have the ability to invest their time and effort into correcting let's say dysfunctional movement pattern what I would much prefer is that no one would ever need to come into the gym because they'd learn proper movement patterns when they were younger because they're allowed unstructured free play and they develop properly physically as a human being. So from the psychological aspect of that, is there things that parents could be doing to make sure that their kids learn to, I don't even know what the process would be, identify, express emotions, develop that full spectrum so that they can develop an awareness so that they don't ever have to get to the point where we have to have the discussion like we had on the weekend. No, I said, I'm like, I feel like it's unnatural Mm. that we have to have this discussion, which is regardless that's nothing right it's neither here nor there like it's a discussion that we're having but I would like to think that if things develop the way that they were supposed to develop that that would become unnecessary in the same way that I believe that if people develop physically the way they were supposed to that my job would be unnecessary Mm. I shouldn't have to rehab people because they should never get physically deconditioned to the point where they hurt themselves picking up their fucking pencil off their office chair yeah it's it's a good question so I, I don't think it's unnatural for people to have these types of responses I think it's actually a natural reaction to dealing with the world okay. not, the, not the response just do you know what I'm saying like the fact that we have to read 10 books to identify the shit that went wrong with me when I was younger so not that we have those, to but those 10 books probably used to be tribal leaders yeah which we don't have anymore yeah right so that's, that's also yeah so that, that's like the, the the wisdom that we get in those books are probably from the tribal leaders like you we it's the constructs that we have around us that we're trying to navigate and I think that's what is you know now it's like well I don't have these tribal leaders so I don't the have job defers to the parents right yeah yeah and, and, and the ill equips themselves yeah and, and the tribe right we've split up the, we've split up the tribe kids go idea. here adults go here grandparents go here yeah right and so because of splitting up the tribe we see what happens and and now there's there's a there's a disrespect to the elders people like respect your elders it's like well they don't respect me I, I fuck I get that as well because some you know I, for a long time I would smile at every old person like I'm one of the good ones like <laughs> like me but yeah. it's just like well fuck I mean that person could be jaded I don't know but I, I'll, I'll respect them the same way I respect any other individual yeah right and I'll also I'm curious I want to ask questions and, and learn because this person has 70 years of life well you don't get it you can't unlock your uh, fucking iPhone it's like yeah dude but they can fucking tell you about the having to ride their horse to, to their girlfriend's place through bush to be able to like yeah th- there's so many things to it so i think the it's the constructs that we like marriage is a construct right and so what 
psychological defenses do we have when our parents divorce when as a human being marriage was something that we constructed in, in, into um, into our lives and then we have this emotional reaction to it and it's just like this is really quite fascinating how deep does this go money is a construct right money is just a trade of cows really of, of, of resources and so it's like we have we are the meaning makers so we control what meaning we give to things and when we realize that and if we're educated that at a young age then we can really start to adapt and change to anything in the environment hmm. that when we like oh you know my parents had a divorce and it was when I failed my high school certificate there fuck off you go put a meaning to that <laughs> there you go let's see how it goes right write yourself up a little story yeah indeed and let that run you know Mm. and people will do it but it's like you you get to choose the meaning and if you're not conscious if you're not aware you will make meaning for it because we have to make meaning for everything that's what we naturally do mm. like where where do I sit in relation to you subconsciously I'll try and make meaning of that he did this and that means he doesn't respect me if I'm not aware it's like he did that based on if I did that it means I wouldn't respect you you don't respect me mm. And it's just like, but you see the world completely different. The Enneagram shows that. The NLP yeah. communication model shows that. We just project. Totally. So, yeah. I'm not sure if that sort of answers your question. But well, it does. Like, and it's all quite interesting. I guess, like I said, because of my my proclivities, I'm always looking for solutions. Like, so, as much as I do like the philosophy, I much prefer it when it leads to a, not a concrete, but something where we have now a step forward to go to tangible something tangible to use yeah because i'm going to be a parent one day i'm sure of that so the bottom line is i feel like it's taken way too lightly or yeah you know completely accidentally for the most part mm. so people by the time they realize they're going to be parents they don't have time to read 800 parenting books and psychology books and talk to other parents or they they have time but they don't make it a priority and that's what scares me but even the kids have meaning like the kids will make meaning to things what do you mean? So the parent does something hmm. and both kids create meaning to it. Hmm. Completely different meaning. Yep. And if they can create completely different meaning, it's not in the adults. Like they, they can only Yeah. They can only do so much. Hmm. And then, you know, the first kid um, was, uh, was two years when the mother got pregnant, right? And then the earliest memories were the mother being sick, morning sickness, and then, you know, the attention went to the mother and the new baby coming and all the things around that. So from like this early nurturance to like, now I'm not here. Yeah. Now I'm not here at all. And then the baby's born and then where's mom, right? And this could be someone's earliest memory. It's a really early memory, but there's a potential for that. And what meaning do they have to that? Yeah. I I don't think that's a bad thing. Like I said, that's what we do. Yeah. But I think there's certain things where it would be hard to argue that they were a positive. Like if you never screamed at your child out of anger, would that affect the way that they developed? Yes, absolutely it would. So I think there's certain things that we could argue are more likely to be positive or good and more likely to be negative and bad. And it all comes from our own shit, really. Like if you, you've had a long day at work, you're not handling things well, you're tired, you're hungry, you snap. That's a bad thing to do. It sounds like a short day at work. <laughs> That's a mistake, do you know what I mean? Like you can look back on that, what we talked about before, things you would look back on with regret to circumvent those things will be seen as a positive. Mm. So how can we make sure that happens more often? Most of the time, it's, it comes from a lack of education or understanding, right? Of self. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think, and I once again, we talk about Peterson a lot in this, but I think Peterson talks about this a lot. And he's like, don't let your kids do things that make you dislike them. Yeah. Right? And... And he gets so much backlash about that. Yeah, but it's like... But it's just from a lack of understanding about what he actually means, though. Oh, dude, I've had to look after so many dogs, right? And I friggin' love dogs. But the thing about it, if the dog's an asshole, I'm like, nah, mate, you can fucking stay outside, right? Yep. I still love the dog, but he's been a little shithead. And I'm like, you can stay outside. And he might be a shithead because I've been away all day, mm. right? And I come in, I'm like, ah, fuck, I don't want to deal with this. You stay outside. And he's like, oh, what have I done? You know, or maybe he's just like, thinks I'm playing a game. I don't know. <laughs> but the thing about it, it's like, um, the dog didn't mean to do that. It, it, it Dogs did just, just love. Being a dog. Yeah, it just, it just dogged, right? Yep. And in that circumstance, it's like if we don't think that we have this dark part of ourselves mm. that is capable of just this 
absolute, you know, disregard for other people. People are like, oh, I could never be like that. It's like, you're fucking like that then, <laughs> right? You are so fucking like that. You may not be like that to your neighbors and everyone else, and maybe you project all this really good things because you care about what they think about you. But when was the last time, you know, you looked at someone and were like, oh, fucking this X racist comment here, right? Yep. But passive racism or passive all that sort of stuff. And it's just like, if... If we think we're not capable of it, then you're most likely the person that is doing it. And it's all quite situational as well. If you live a fucking amazing life where everything's catered for, then what have you got to be angry about? Well, you put yourself in a situation where, you know, you if you were in the, that person's exact same situation, then you do the exact same thing. Like, I think that is a, a realisation that can be helpful. Is like, if you live that person's exact life, then you would be doing exactly what that person's doing. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's like... Um the couple of the league one of the boys that I train in a group of older fellas that are over 40 and uh, when I told him the quote I think I probably told you this I told him the quote of uh, a good man is not a harmless man yep. a good man is a very very dangerous man that has it under voluntary control mm. right and he laughed but he, like in agreement and then he goes he goes I've got mates and I think he's done work he's, he's an ag farm consultant and I think he's done work with the US government right no, he definitely has and he goes, I've got mates that are like, I would never work for the US government. And he just looks at them and goes, have you been offered? No. It's like, so how would you know? Yeah, I would never do that. It's just like... Yeah, it's a very dangerous thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, how many people eat? I mean, I've eaten my words. I would never be like that. Yeah. You know, five years later, I'm laying there and I'm like, holy shit. Just don't say it. Yeah. It's a bad thing to say. Well, whatever we resist, we persist. Um, and I had this conversation um, with a guy once and he, he you know... Um, this is a pretty common thing though even though I'm saying I've had this conversation it's one I'm recalling but this is saying that's really consistent you, the same thing with movement and I want to get into that in a minute because you start to see patterns you're like okay ankle lack of ankle dorsiflexion is probably going to lead to this which is probably going to lead to this and then it's like does it hurt your knees when you do this they're like yeah you're amazing you're like but you start to see patterns right yeah and so um, the somebody was out of control and they were in pain so I'm going to control things yeah right I'm going to control things and then not realizing that creates the same pain, hmm. right? Because whatever you try to control controls you, which means you're actually out of control because that thing's controlling you. Yeah. And it's just like this paradox. Well, the control's like an illusion, right? Well, we often try to control things because we ourselves are out of control, especially if they're external things. But it's, it's that thing where it's like, oh, he's in pain because of that. I'm going to do the opposite and I won't be in pain. It's like, yeah, dude, whatever you're resisting, you, you, the, the, not, not, the, not the behavior, but the, the symptom will, will still show. It'll be the same fucking symptom. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. So do you see, I mean, because uh, we're, we're in similar training spaces. However, uh, I, I would hand over my, you know, I'd be like, look, sit down I want to hear everything you know about movement there's plenty of things there that I don't know that I could definitely learn and so in that do you because I know I do but I think you would have more research back behind it because the amount of not, like while I've been looking at psychology you've been looking at that yeah what are the main patterns you see in people when it comes to movement that is most easily avoidable yet makes the biggest impact in their life negatively I suppose it depends how you define easily avoidable. No, no, no. Just, just have one answer. This is what you do to me all the time. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples. So, yeah, do that. I think it's well, it just depends on what someone's willing to do. So, I think it's easy to avoid sitting down for work. Yeah. Like sit stand desk. Like there's options. It's quite well documented that the deleterious effects of sitting down all day. They say sitting's a new smoking. Like this is not news, and you're not a weird person if you have a sit stand desk anymore, right? Yeah. But there's still people who don't want to make a fuss or they don't believe that it, all the hype is that bad for you or they're wearing shit shoes or they're like there's so many things that will contribute to poor posture which I think are quite easy to correct which means that you don't have to do 20 minutes of glute activation and core work every time you come to the gym before you can execute the movements that you need to execute so that's quite simple things where people are unwilling to make changes based on what I'll consider to be quite trivial reasons so I don't want to make a fuss or I don't want to wear those shoes because they don't look as cool as my high heels. Yep. So there's decisions that people are making on a daily basis which are 100% contributing to their movement quality being dog shit, which are, I would argue like very simple to fix. Sure. So, and what this kind of leads to is stuff that's 
nothing new that I'm inventing, but... How about I, that drill? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm right, sorry for everyone listening. I'm right next to the mechanics. Like, not right next to us, in the next door. Hey, Bob. But yeah, to, Tommy. It's Tommy. <laughs> so, upper body, lower body cross syndrome. These things come from being put in poor postural positions, which develops weakness, which perpetuates the cycle of weakness and tightness. Mm-hmm. So, if anybody doesn't know, upper body cross syndrome is... If you picture a person standing from side on, you essentially have a cross that goes across their body from, let's say, the top of their, the back of their neck to the front of their chest, moving downwards and then back the other way as well. So what it's been documented is that people tend to have tight uh, pecs and upper traps. So that's the cross going down diagonal to the front and then weak neck flexors and lower traps. Yeah. So upper body, upper body cross. And then the lower body, you have the same thing where we have weak glutes and core and tight erectors and hip flexors yep. so it tends to put us in an exaggerated curve so like a high heel looking at my iphone position yeah pretty much yeah but with your neck cranked out like that yeah so yeah yeah, things that are sort of lengthened and weakened and things that are shortened and tightened and that's where people always get pain and tightness in their back and in the hip flexors their ass and their abs don't work properly they get pain in their neck and they get t- tightness in the chest and their neck the front of their neck is weak and their, their lower traps the middle of their shoulder blades are weak so these are all things that are exacerbated by having poor posture for a large period of the day, which is just not necessary, no. I would argue, these days. Yeah. Maybe 50 years ago, you have to have a fucking medical exemption if you want to not sit down all day in shit shoes. Whereas nowadays, it's just not... There's enough evidence to support the decision to take care of your body without having to waste... Well, it just means you, you double the amount of time you need to spend doing corrective work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just makes it so much harder to maintain that balance. And this is the thing about health is that you're going to pay for health at some point. Yep. So, like, I, I feel like I know at least, if not the answer, the direction for this, but what is... Because uh, this is something that I, I see really common and I just, I leave it as best I can. Like, you know, I've been to family dinners where cousins are like, like, oh, can you write me a diet plan? I'm like... <laughs> Gross. No. <"Nah." laughs> right? <laughs> I actually can't write. Yeah. I'm yeah. illiterate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, okay. www.google.com. They're like, it's not a diet plan. It's like, why are you asking? They're like, they've been like, you know, you're lucky. Look at your genetics. I'm like, it's it's documented in my family. We, we can we can easily be unhealthy. Like, don't, don't do that sort of stuff, right? I've easily put on weight before as well. But it's like, I've been in an environment where I'm like, yeah, I can't, I don't want to do that, right? It's my values. But, and it's sort of like, it's it's looking at this sort of stuff and going, it's so easy to be like, uh, your genetics are this and your genetics are that. Can you give me a global thing? And so I have people be like, what are the best exercises for ex, you know, for strength, for fat loss, for whatever it may be? And I look at their posture and I'm like... It's the least of your Yeah, exactly right. But what happens is that we have these instabilities, and I really want to get your right thoughts on this. Um, they have these instabilities, let's call them that, right? Deficiencies in movement. And then we just exercise them. What's the end result of that? Depends on the exercise. Okay, and depends on the indeficient, you know, deficiencies. Yeah, like I think you can definitely, like the first thing that I'll do with someone will always be breathing. doesn't matter who they are. Their first session's always, they're spent at least half an hour on the ground doing breathing stuff. And if they don't like that, then this isn't the gym for you. Right. Because if you're not willing to spend half an hour of your life building a foundation that's going to positively affect the rest of your not only your exercise but your life then you're not the kind of person that we want to work with so Mm -hmm. people generally come to me when they're injured which helps because they're not like chomping the bit like let's squat I want to deadlift I want to clean it's like like they're like I I want to not hurt when I get up out of bed so I'm like cool let's lay down here (laughs) so it's easy to get buy-in from those sorts of people people who don't work with rehab people it's going to be tougher and you're going to have to be more more forceful with with I guess the way you explain your philosophy to them and why this sort of stuff's important so for me it's kind of an easy sell especially if you can get someone like a big reduction in pain within the first session that's how you get buy-in straight off the bat right so depending on what you do with someone you can build upon what you assess to be their weaknesses with exercises that still make them feel like they're working without reinforcing bad movement patterns so what i think is is a big deficiency within like the, the physio realm from what i see is that i get a lot of people who come from physio Some have had results, some who haven't, but what there tends to be missing is the return to what they were doing before. So it's like you you have a rotator cuff tear, you go to the physio, 
they do some release work, they give you some exercise and some stretches, you would do a few band extended rotations, your shoulder pain goes away, you get back to bench pressing and tear your pack again. Yeah. So it's like, there's not a lot of the bridge in between what gets you out of pain and how you can get back to using a lot of load because how much load can you use on a band extended rotation? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, how can you... I think the physio sees their job as getting you to stop hurting and then the person, it's almost like you have to... They're trusted to get themselves back to that level without mm. being stupid but people yeah, don't yeah, want to do yeah. that because as soon as you're out of pain, you're good to go back to bench in 100, right? Yeah. So what we try to do is build the bridge from getting out of pain back to like full scale high level dynamic movement without reinforcing those bad movement patterns again so what we try to do is a lot of the rehab exercise that we program will be loadable at some point so you'll keep that in there so you might be you might have a dysfunctional pattern on a squat for example so we'll do corrective stuff to get you to let's say you have back pain and knee pain we'll do some position resetting it might take you maybe a couple of weeks to learn how to set your positions right then we'll start to do some sort of actual exercise it might start off looking kind of like a rehabby exercise which is not fun and people don't want to do that but very soon it turns into an exercise that's actually challenging so they still feel like they're working out and i think that is the the challenge is to get someone to to make it so that the exercises that keep them healthy are the exercises that they can enjoy as well mm. and then it might be you might have your programs 100 percent rehab at the start and then it drops back to 70 percent rehab 30 percent stuff that feels like you're working out and then it's like 50 50 and then it's like sure. 30 70 yeah. and you might keep maybe 20 to 30 percent of your program as exercises like you said which is not reactive but it's proactive so you maintain balance yeah. throughout your program and if you have exercises that are that are putting you weight out of balance and you just have to drop them for a little while it's sort of like the idea like if you're not prepared to prehab a little you're going to have to rehab a lot yeah 100%. You know, it's uh it's sort of it's hard to sell that for and you know, i'm not saying that as in like for people who aren't hurt, it's hard to get it. Oh, dude, absolutely. They're like, I'm fine. What are you talking about? It's like, yeah. well, I, I, what I if you're not? I'll, yeah, that's right. I asked the question. It's like, all right, are there any injuries or restrictions that I should be wary of? Which was funny when someone go, what's the difference? I'm like, pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, the worst injury it was in all. front of a group of people too. They're like, oh. <laughs> it was just like, anyway, moving on. But it was like, is there any injuries or restrictions that I should be made wary of? And this question is a twofold question. One is, what are they willing to let me know? Um, are they actually wary of any of their, you know, um, indeficiencies, deficiencies, right? Yep. Indeficiencies. <laughs> Most of them aren't. Right. But the, the, no, that's the thing. So they go, no, nothing. And I'm like, you're, you're a 43-year-old individual. You have injuries waiting to occur in that case. Yeah. Because there's, the thing about it is, if, you know, if I buy a, a 40-year-old car off you, that's not really serviced that often. It runs fine, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, all right. So don't drive over 40 kilometers an hour, right? Don't drive it around rattle. the suburb. Oh, yeah. that, yeah, that's been there for ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, if we just smack <laughs> it, that's all we do, right? But it's the exact same thing. It's like, we, somebody goes, oh, why does this hurt? It's like, fuck, I don't know. How many times have you rolled your right ankle in your teens? Like, it's, it's, there could be a whole range of reasons that. It's lack of awareness again. Yeah, and so it gives me that, uh, that two prong is the second is how well do they know their body? And so, um, and that, that's not a matter of like me testing to see how well they know their body. It's like, how much do I have to work with this person to, to sort of realize how much they know their body? Well, if they knew it well, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Even like the highest level athletes that I've worked with is still, most of the time they get there because they have a natural inclination for athletic performance, not because they've necessarily worked their ass off to get there for the most part. Mm. Like it's the, the fringe athletes who never quite had a lot of natural talent or left their run a little bit too late or whatever it might be or injured when they were younger they are the ones who tend to have a better understanding and have a higher propensity to, to move on to be a high level coach after that yeah whereas yeah. like your highest level athletes like it's just all inbuilt but it's also um, it's inbuilt the other thing about it psychology like psychologically wise like psychologically wise well probably are psychologically wise but it's more like they've had so much more things given to them what do you mean so um you know, I I, I remember like for scholarships, scholarships, um, uh, sponsorships, and, and I'm not saying that's not how it should be done. It's just like you compare that to the person that will fucking Let's like pay their own way. Oh, mate, like you know, just from the work their ass off to to raise the funds to do those sorts of things. It's, we have to understand that's going to affect these two people differently, mm. and it doesn't mean this person still won't donate money to the right things. And I'm not saying that at all. Like they they're the meaning makers all over again, so they get to do whatever it is. This person that work their way up there could be like nah man you got to do it yourself you got to work all that forgetting that other people help them mm. and that's the same thing as like when people feel unsupported it's like have you spoken to the farmer that farmed your fucking food that you ate today it's like you feel unsupported 
what about the people that, that supported your plate man like yeah you know what about the people when you turn the water on did you feel unsupported by the people that are fucking making sure the water's running yeah you know there's people that do that right yeah no, it's magic <laughs> yeah yeah that's right you're like no the lights don't come on i feel so unsupported it's just it's that it's like it's lack of awareness it's and it's lack of the big picture and it's really easy to get stuck in that and i, I get stuck in it right i'm there and i'm like fucking right and then i catch myself doing it and i'm like ah oh, doing the thing again I'm doing the thing again and i'm like right okay this served my old story it doesn't serve my new story i need a new level of thinking in order to move forward okay what else could this mean and then yeah you, know, you start asking better questions mm, that's the key right but you need to have like how long did it take you to get to this level of awareness where you can actually even be have some sort of observation of that like to be able to, years. to be able to stop yourself and be like wait a minute Whereas before you'd have blown straight past it, rode that wave of fucking indignation into your next meeting with someone and tell them about how annoying it was that your fucking car didn't start. Yeah. Well, you fucking make a car. Yeah. And make it start every time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, feel like so unsupported. But it, it's... It, the question is how long. It's like, how long is, is however long it takes you to get to a point to do that sort of stuff? Yeah. There are so many things that I do today that in five years time, I'm like, ah, uh, right... And so it's just this continual unraveling. But the first thing, the first thing is moving into this awareness. Is the number one first thing. Yeah. And um and that's where like with movement awareness, let's call it that, it's it's best to have a coach with that. Oh, for sure. And so um we can watch as many YouTube videos as you want, but it's better to have a coach for that. And so that's why I choose to have a coach with helping me bring awareness to the things that I'm not conscious that I'm running, the programs and all that sort of stuff. And that's why I do what I do because I've seen people make significant shifts in their ability to be understanding of their own behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I'll sit here in a, in a coaching session, which I do some, a lot of sessions here, and if the, the person is like talking about everyone else, I'm like, oh, like we're going to stop this coaching session if you're going to come here and continually talk about everyone else. It's just like... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that that like. Oh, Whereas, yeah. Well, otherwise, they can just run it and run it and be like, ah, I feel way better now. Yeah. Even though you've literally just completely externalized all the blame in your life. Yeah, I'm not a hairdresser. Like. Yeah. So, my friend, I think it's almost time for you to go. Yeah. Good how was your fin lagging? It was strong, huh? It's really set fire to my entire body. <laughs> it fucking warms you, you up. Sip, and when you sit, breathe out through your nose. When you swallow it. Is that the trick? Um, are you talking about whiskey? What else to be talking about? Um, that, that's definitely a bit better with some Did ice. We? I think you swallowed Did before it went down, which makes it worse. <laughs> um, bit a bit of ice in that fin lag, and will uh, will be a treat. But yeah, that, that shit warms you up. I saw how much Sean poured for you, and I'm like, oh, this guy's trying to fucking kill me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't think he appreciates it quite yet. <laughs> Mate, thank you very much for jumping on the podcast. Um, I I, uh, I enjoy doing this. I think it's probably going to be a I don't know, monthly or almost bi-monthly thing anyway. Yeah, my pleasure. It's always a good good time. Mm, indeed. Otherwise, until next time, peace and pizza. Ciao. Ooh. Me too.